Latina success stories coming up right now on The Leadership Voice. Welcome to The Leadership Voice. I'm your host, Jay Barbudo. Today's show features Hispanic women that have achieved extraordinary success starting their own businesses. The Leadership Voice welcomes Patty Arviello, founder and president of New American Funding, and Tina Aldatz, founder of Foot Pedals and Savvy Travelers. We also have a special leadership lesson today on overcoming diversity challenges being delivered by Dr. Sean Pickler. So let's start things off with today's quote of the day. Today's quote comes from novelist, philosopher, and advocate for human rights, Ayn Rand. The question isn't, who is going to let me? Instead, the question we should be asking is, who is going to stop me? Our first guest today on The Leadership Voice is Patty Arviello. Patty Arviello started her career from scratch, stepping out of her immediate circle and comfort zone to break into a business for which she had no previous experience. 35 years later, she is a nationally recognized businesswoman leading a mortgage bank with over 2,300 employees and 140 branches across the United States. She is influencing the real estate finance industry with lending policy initiatives, and she is a strong advocate for the upward mobility of women in the workplace. To better serve Hispanic communities, Patty spearheaded the Latino Focus Committee within her organization. Their mission is to identify and address challenges Hispanic consumers face in their pursuit of home ownership and to enhance the quality of their lending experience. Her vast experience, commitment, and dedication has led to her recent appointment to a three-year term on the Consumer Advisory Board by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Patty is also on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee and Consumer Affairs Advisory Council for the Mortgage Bankers Association. She is a former member of the Fannie Mae Affordable Housing Advisory Council and Freddie Mac Community Lender Advisory Board. She also serves on the Latino Donor Collaborative Board and Ernst & Young honored her as winner for the 2016 EY Entrepreneur of the Year for Orange County. She won a Silver Stevy Award for Women of the Year category and the LA Times Latino De Hoy honored her as a 2016 Business Award winner. It is with great pleasure that we at The Leadership Voice welcome an innovative and thoughtful leader who has overcome many odds to make it in the business world. Please welcome Patty Aviello. Thank you. That was a, a lot to say and what you did, a phenomenal job. Well, it was so much to say because you've had so many recognitions and so many awards and we're so proud of you, and Thank we're so you. proud to have you on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me here today. Our viewers are very excited to hear your story and to hear a little bit about you. So maybe we could start by having you share a little bit about yourself and how you started this great company of oh, yours. Great. So I really appreciate you guys having me here today. So my story is very simple. So I grew up here. You know, I'm from La Mirada. Mm -hmm. and, um, I've I heard of that. You have heard. It's a little town down the street. And of course, had the visions of attending this beautiful college. And uh, I actually walked onto this college campus and didn't have the great opportunity as all these students have to be able to enroll because we, my family obviously didn't have financial means at that time. So it was a goal. So I'm super happy to be here. I feel like it's you know like in my backyard. Um, so starting in my business, well, I was 16, so I didn't really at that point know enough, right, to not know. Right. But I was very driven at a very young age. It, it kind of comes with that Latina fire that we have culturally. So it was, I felt like as being the oldest child in my family, that it was my duty to serve. And of course, I had to succeed because it's my duty to take care of my family. Right. So it really was the burning fire. No, that's terrific. Yeah. So how did you how did you found the company? How did you start this thing? Yeah. So um, a calamity of errors, failures. Um, working for people that weren't that great to me, working for people that inspired me, finding mentors, I mean, falling all over my place and never giving up. Like I've never not been in mortgage banking or in some form. So I knew that I loved this industry because I could see clearly that there was tons of opportunity for me to climb the ladder of success. But it doesn't mean it was easy. I mean, I fell down that ladder many, many times. 
And you know, when I talk about being a committed business leader, I was also very committed to my industry. And I still am, that's why I'm an advocate for it because I really felt, feel like it's given me a life that I never dreamt I would have. Oh, that's terrific. Could you talk a little bit about some of the obstacles that you had to overcome along the way, especially early in your career? Sure. So um, not being a college graduate was one. I was yeah. super insecure about that until about eight years ago when I proudly now say that I gave birth to an awesome college graduate, but I didn't have the opportunity myself. But I think it's an incredible journey. And I think... Um, but it doesn't prevent you from being, from being me, from, from being successful. I think that your only obstacle is yourself. So it just, it's been an incredible journey of just falling and, and, and getting up and breaking through that kind of ceiling of adversity. I never let anything stop me. So there really isn't anything that I haven't experienced. And when you ask me, have you dealt with this, being a woman? Have you dealt with this, being a Latina? Yes, I've dealt with any single ticketed item that we call adversity, but I busted through it. And so when, you, when you've overcome uh, different obstacles along the way, it seems like every time you fell down, you, you would just get right back up. And, right. and you'd never give up. No. And, and it seems like a, whenever we talk to a lot of successful entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. we find that their lives and their path was not just success after success after success after success. Right but that it's much more of a jagged up and down, up and down, up and down path. Right. Um, it's that roller coaster of life that was in that movie. The ups and the downs, the ups and the downs. I think today social media gives this kind of vision that maybe you're watching your peers being young and successful and everything's so great and they're succeeding every day. That's social media. Real life, real life is the failures that you achieve. And the earlier you achieve them, really dictates the earlier you succeed. So, you know, I kind of don't really, I let my children fall, I'm 27 and 26, I continually let them make mistakes. It's very easy for me to go fix it. But, but what we don't understand on those days where you feel like it's not gonna ever go away, this too shall pass always comes in my mind, you have to get up. Because the difference between somebody like me and somebody that has the ability to be like me is the one who busted through adversity, the one who can wake up and go, you know what, bring it on and get up and just deal with, with whatever problem it is that day. It could be a financial problem, it could be a person problem, a leadership problem, a personal problem. You just gotta get up, you've got to deal it face forward. You know, I think that's terrific and I think it's a great lesson for our viewers to really take heart to and that is that it's not just how you succeed but it's, it's how you fail and how quickly you, quickly you fail, how quickly right. you recover from failure and how you learn from your failure. And it's obviously you have um, done a great job. Yeah, of, I'm a great demonstration of failure <laughs> to success. Yeah, uh, I, sadly I am as well <laughs> of, of no, I having get lots it. of yeah. failures. Yeah. Um, so could we talk a little bit about the Latina part? Um, yes. How being a Latina entrepreneur, uh, how that might have presented unique challenges for you? Well, first off, um, I'm one of those like woke up my life knowing I was different. My mother was a maid. She cleaned the houses of my friends from grade school. So my former class, my classmates would come to school and my mom was their maid. So I'm a product of a housekeeper. Right. And I think the imagery in the United States of America is that, that they're not breeding successful people. Well, I am, I am that person. And my mom, I was very proud that my mom was a housekeeper. I was proud because she was self-employed. Mm -hmm. Okay, she was an entrepreneur. Right. She was home when I got home from school. And I just was always super proud. So I never saw being a Latina as anything other than an advantage because I kind of liked being different. I kind of liked I spoke two languages and everybody else didn't. Mm -hmm. So maybe that we have to use what we're born with as an advantage. My, my immigrant perspective is my fire. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. So growing up in that environment, did, would you say that that even motivated you even more then to... Well, that's a Latino. You know, we talk a lot about, especially now, you know, the immigrants and that. But what people don't understand, it's our culture. We're a culture in this country. We're Latinos. We're made up of different countries. But we have this fire that burns in us to succeed. We're, you know, the largest percentage of self-employment going on right now are Latinas. Latinas are driving self-employment up in the United States of America by percentage more than any other demographic in our country. 
So it's just culturally where we come from, we're expected to succeed. My grandmother knew right away, I'm the oldest grandchild, she looked at me when I was eight, she said, you're gonna be the one who's gonna buy me the house. So we're bred to kind of take care of our family and we're very foundational. So that fire kind of burns in us. No, that's wonderful. And I think that's, I think it's a great uh, testament to both your, your upbringing and your culture, but also to your desire to, to really make, to make your mark. And you've definitely done that. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about your philosophy of diversity and inclusion and how you've um, perhaps uh, shaped some of the policies at, uh, at, at uh, New American Funding. So great, so diversity and inclusion, of course, such a huge policy um, process through our country. Major corporations call me all the time, how are you building a company in a white dominated field, especially men, we're a male dominant field. Anything in the financial services industry is still very male dominant. How are you doing this? Well, first off, I don't see diversity and inclusion as a policy. It, I am diverse. That's right. So it is who I am, and I'm inclusive because I'm a people person. So I see it more of doing rather than a policy. So of course, I've kind of, you know, I wasn't educated. I just am that diversity and inclusion kind of role model. Right. But I do see in our company, which right now today in Orange County is 58% women over male employed and 43% minority employed in an industry that doesn't mirror ourselves. So I've taken it upon myself to really put myself out there so that the young generation can see mirrors of themselves. Because listen, I could look at someone like me with these extraordinary students working, you know, very, very hard to accomplish a big goal, much harder than I probably did in my 20s. Going to school is a commitment and doing well is another commitment. I mean, there's several commitments in going to school. But what we lack is mirrors in diversity in our media, on TV. There aren't people that look like me. So it's putting ourselves out there, and it's my responsibility to take even the younger generation of Latinas and say, okay, here I am. You can do it. I am here. We're not all J-Lo and Sofia Vergara. We are business women that are running successful companies. So, you know, I think that it's, it's our generation and me serving the next generation to get them to come from behinds because they're brilliant, and they're, and they're pushing their businesses here in, a, in our country. And you're creating opportunities, but even perhaps even more importantly, you're setting an example for for I'm young trying. for young Latinas and young women and and young any young aspiring entrepreneurs. Right. You're showing folks that anything is possible, and that with hard work and res resiliency, you can achieve things. Right, absolutely. It's it's all it, everything is here for you to have. That's the beauty of our country. There are zero ceilings. You are your own ceiling. You got to remove those barriers yourself and just bust through them. That's why it's so great to be in our country. So I have one final question, yeah. and this is a, my favorite question. So imagine if you were talking to a young aspiring entrepreneur, it could be a, a man, it could be a woman, it could be Hispanic, it could be mm -hmm. any, any demographic. But if you were talking to a young aspiring entrepreneur who wanted to build a great business, what advice would you give somebody if they were looking to start their own business and they wanted it to be really successful and thriving? What advice would you give a young aspiring? <laughs> I love that. So entrepreneurship is a beautiful gift. And something I learned later in life that I wish I'd known younger was my strengths versus my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And there's a great book. It's called Strengths Finders. Mm -hmm. yep. And you can take a simple test and you, it will be so clear on what you're really good at and what you're not good at. So to hire to your weaknesses, not to your strengths. I do that now, but I learned that really late in life, really like seven years ago when I was starting to build this company. You know, we've grown 600% yeah. in like six years. So I think if you can master that when you're young and you can take a test that will clearly show and identify your strengths in leadership, because we're not all born leaders, right? You can become a leader, or maybe we're born leaders and we don't know how to use our leadership skills. Really identifying your strengths and knowing who you are to the core works. It does. It works in leadership. And then I'm a great recruiting. I, I recruit talent like no other. I love people. But I don't hire people that mirror me. I hire people that do, are really good at what I'm not good at. And I let them thrive in my organization. And I think that's important very early on. So you would say, so the biggest advice you'd give them is know yourself, know, know your yourself, strengths, yes. and surround yourself with people that can complement yes. and fill in, fill in. whatever your weaknesses are. Because none of us are good at everything. 
Trust me, we may think we are, but identifying your real strengths and your leadership skills early on will help you build a platform because really entrepreneurship and growing a business, you are a leader, especially when you're employing 2,500 people. They okay. look at you to be an example. No, that's terrific. Well, um, Patty, I want to thank you for being on the show today. It's my pleasure. And you're going to come back and help us with Q&A in a little while. Awesome. Um, I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you for You've been a me. terrific guest. Thank as, you. As I fully expected. <laughs> and um, so I'm just really excited you could be here. Thank you. My pleasure. And now it's time for a feature segment on The Leadership Voice. It's today's Did You Know? Today's Did You Know? comes from Fortune.com. Did you know that diverse companies are 35% more likely to outperform companies that lack diversity? This means that not only does creating a diverse workplace lead to a wider variety of perspectives and views, it is proven that your organization will outperform less diverse organizations. It's now time for our Leadership Countdown, where we give our viewers a useful list of key strategies or tips to guide your quest for excellence. Today's Leadership Countdown comes from leadersinheels.com. We bring you the three tips to help overcome diversity issues at work. Number one is to show respect for everyone. No matter what others may do or say, be the bigger person by not engaging poorly or contributing to a negative culture. You don't know and may never know what's happening in someone else's life, so never become disrespectful, even if every ounce of you wants to. Number two, never speak badly of others. Remember, every time you speak badly to someone, it reflects upon you and not the person you're talking poorly about. So many of us speak badly or gossip about other people, but when we do this, it is indicative of the type of person we are, and it destroys our own brand, making it even harder to overcome potential barriers. And number three, create win-win outcomes. In every conversation, aim for a win-win outcome. When you walk away, Ensure that you both feel good. Even if the conversation is a tough one, words can be delivered in such a way that the other person doesn't feel belittled. This is not always easy. And sometimes you may have to swallow a bit of pride to make sure that you're leaving the other person feeling better. But in the long run, others will gravitate towards you and welcome your ongoing dialogues. And that, viewers, has been your Leadership Countdown as we have shared three tips for overcoming diversity challenges at work. So learn and practice every one of these. Stick around because we have Tina Aldatz in the studio. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Well, we found here at Honda Center in Anaheim Ducks that, that the Center for Leadership brings expertise in doing research, in doing training, the faculty that has come and, and, and given the training to our employees does all the research themselves. They're not pulling this information off the shelf. They're out there researching themselves, talking from first-hand experience, and it brings such a level of competency that we, again, don't find from, from other trainers that are on the market. Well, simply put, is, is what really differentiates and distinguishes Fullerton and the Center for Leadership um, really is your expertise. You guys um, are able to create customized content for our business based on true research. The faculty um, from Cal State Fullerton, obviously they're, they're professors of their field, they um, have deep knowledge and research, um, but also aside from the theory, they really bring in some practical examples and they bring in a lot of interactive activities. The Bringing Learning to Work initiative is our way of meeting the needs of Orange County businesses and communities. When our clients ask the Center for Leadership to come to bring learning to work, the clients know that they're getting cutting edge information, the latest thinking in the field, but they're also getting world-class training. Welcome back to The Leadership Voice. Our next guest today on The Leadership Voice is Tina Aldatz. Tina Aldatz is an entrepreneur, a philanthropist, an author, and a film producer. She made her mark on the world as a self-starting entrepreneur and founder of Foot Pedals, the revolutionary line of designer insole cushions for women's high heels. 
As a child, Tina severely burned her feet after accidentally stepping on buried hot coals at the beach. From her foot injury, Tina created foot pedals to help fill a gap in the market for women's high-heeled foot support. Through her strength and tenacity, foot pedals became a successful multi-million dollar company recognized by Inc. 500 as one of the 500 fastest growing companies in America. Tina continues to be featured in media such as Entrepreneur Magazine and Forbes named her an entrepreneur to watch. After growing up in a volatile home, Tina overcame life's obstacles by grasping opportunities and not letting life's circumstances define her future. Tina shares how she took a personal tragedy and turned it into her destiny in her autobiography, From Stilettos to the Stock Exchange, Inside the Life of a Serial Entrepreneur. In the book, Tina shares her core business values and practices that have led to her success. Currently, Tina is the CEO of Savvy Travelers, alongside her best friend, co-founder, and president, Margarita Flores. Savvy Travelers provides high-performance cosmetic wipes that are individually packaged in a disposable sheet form that make life easier and healthier for any on-the-go woman. So without further ado, we are pleased to welcome on The Leadership Voice, Tina Aldetz. Hey, Jay. <laughs> Tina, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. It's, My life has come full circle, like I said. Uh, yes, you, know. you have. You are back in Fullerton. Yes. Uh, you grew up in Fullerton. I did. You went to school in Fullerton. Yes. And now here you are in Fullerton. Love it. Um, I'm very, very, very honored to be here. Thank you. Um, the, we at the Center for Leadership and here at Cal State Fullerton are honored to have you on campus. And we're so excited to have you on the show. Thank you. Uh, we're going to love hearing about you and hearing about your story. Our viewers can't wait to hear about these these adventures, the adventures of Tina Aldetz. Yes, there are many. <laughs> and so let's let, maybe we can start. If you could share a little bit about your background leading up to founding Foot Pedals. Okay. Well, um, my background. Let's see. You know that I didn't come from a traditional upbringing. So I had several socioeconomic disadvantages. Um, but going into bringing up foot pedals, creating a product, actually they say that necessity is the mother of invention, mm -hmm. right? I didn't invent insoles, I just made them sexy. So, oh, of course you did. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the whole reason and why this happened, and trust me, I wouldn't have known at nine years old that this tragedy that happened not only to me, but to my whole family, of burning my feet. We were um, in Santa Monica Beach and coals were buried in the sand. Well, sand is a conduit, right? It holds the heat. So I ran across not seeing the coals and all of the skin was burned off my feet. That was an impetus to turn it, taking me and changing my life. And the reason, one of the things I say is, do you wanna change a child's future? Change their environment. So I, as a result of that injury, my burns were so severe in 1979, I was brought to one of the only burn centers in the world, UC Irvine, which happens to be here in Orange County. So we had to move here. My mother, single mother, raising three children, I'm the eldest, and I come to Orange County and I'm like, oh my God, this place is so different than East LA and everywhere else that I've seen. Being Mexican, all of the stereotypical situations were part of my life. Um, and I came to this place, my first day in fourth grade, I was on crutches because I spent the whole summer in the hospital. And this kid rolls up in a limo. I'm like, are you kidding me? What is going on here? Right. So I ended up saying, one day I'm gonna get one of those and stopped drawing pictures of myself in a wedding dress. And I started drawing pictures of myself in a limo with a, holding a briefcase and I wanted to be a businesswoman. Flash forward, working throughout the fashion industry, I started at South Coast Plaza working for Victoria's Secret. Well, I got transferred to New York City. I always wanted to live there because that was part of that vision of being a city girl, working girl, you know? Right. I mean, not that kind of working girl, but you no, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, <laughs> and then, yeah. um, the so, one. right, right, businesswoman. So I wanted to be a businesswoman. Well, I arrived in New York City and I like to wear high heels. I'm working for, you know, one of the famous, you know, sexy companies of the world. And then I move and I get recruited to a fashion designer. And my life is like the Devil Wears Prada. Runways, models, the whole thing. 
but I like to wear the high heels. In California, I drive from one end of the parking lot to the other end of the parking lot. I don't walk here, we don't walk. But in New York, my feet were in so much pain that I kept going to, you know, like, like Dwayne Reed, little shoe cobblers, whatever, getting cushions, and I would doctor up my shoes because I didn't want to wear sneakers with my like sexy outfits, right? Or business outfits. Right. Um, and eventually, later on, um, there was a time when I came back to California, still working for BCBG at the time, and then I decided to make a jump, take a risk, and it was during the dot-com phase, right? Right. Well, I was really impressed with this girl that had this MBA, and she had gotten millions of dollars to start a company, and I was the vice president of marketing. I'm like, we're going we're gonna to kill it. I just know this is it. That girl spent $2,000 on office chairs, so let's just say the dot-com went dot-gone, right? And I didn't have a job. So I was like, no, no problem, easy. I'll just go apply it anywhere. Well, during that time, people that were highly educated, overqualified, were standing in line for clerk positions. I don't have a formal education. So I went to The Gap, and I'm like, it's your lucky day. I'm going to like totally be your new merchandising director. And I went in for the interview, and they were like, oh, yeah, well, the best we can do is offer you a position as a cashier. And I was like, what? So insulted. But my, because I do not have a formal education, that really hurt me. So I came up with an idea, showed my best friend. She lived in New York at the time, mm -hmm. Margarita. Right. She was here in LA for Market Week. And I said, look, I've got this idea for these little cushions. And I'm just going to take off my shoe and show you what it is. So you see these little cu this little cushion here at the mm -hmm. ball of the foot? Yeah, it's a little leopard. Yeah. it's. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not calling it a cougar. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, if I had thought of that, I would right? have said <laughs> um, So... I showed her, and she was like, well, let me, let me take it around to some buyers and see, see what, we, what they think. Calls me back, and she's like, Tina, I think we really have something here. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm living in an apartment with my father, my two younger brothers. I scrape up the money that I have, and I make a prototype. And we take it to our first trade show. And during this time, this is about a six-month period. Okay, so January, I see her create the prototype. We go to our first trade show in August. And I'm not kidding. We wrote orders, work, like purchase order, purchase order, purchase order. All these stores, big department stores, everybody wrote the order. This is in 2001, August. So we walk out. We've got about $50,000 in orders. I mean, that is huge when you're a startup in 2001, you know. And so we were just on cloud nine. Mm -hmm. Well, as we went into production and I placed the order with the factory and did it all, what happens next? One month later, 9-11. Oh we goodness. were in business and out of business within a course of three months. So we kind of overcame that by turning, you know, kind of turning gears and going after a different market. Our buyers were literally calling and saying, we're canceling our purchase order, canceling our purchase order, canceling our purchase order. We're not bringing in new vendors. So what do you do? Wow. And so how did you build the business from this startup size to becoming one of the fastest growing um, businesses in the country? Well, the way that we specifically... What, what helped you turn that corner? Well, what helped us turn the corner is, and this is something I think that's really common with women, um, we have the ability to be um, multifaceted. Or you can kind of, okay, well, we just spilled the milk. That's okay. We'll drink orange juice today. Like, you know, we, we can turn the channel quickly. And that's exactly what we had to do. We had to completely change our business model. And instead of going after big department stores, what I was used to dealing with, my comfort zone, we decided instead to go to mom and pop shops. And the first company that wrote a purchase order with us at that time was a bridal store in Alaska. And I'm like, if we can sell cushions for high heels in Alaska, we got this. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was certainly not easy, but that became, you know, continual and and getting those reorders and making products that do not have expiration dates. If you think of fashion and you think of milk, they're both perishable. 
you have only a few weeks on the rack before it starts to hit markdowns, markdown, sale, clearance. Everybody loses money when that happens, especially the manufacturer. So we decided to create a product that was seasonless, that had you know, a long shelf life, that was consumable and replenishable. So that really helped build our business. Then I went back to school and I became a certified pedorthist, meaning if a podiatrist diagnosed you with you know, club foot, okay, well, I know how to fix that according, I know how to make a prescription orthotic to accommodate that. So I utilized that education and I created a brand of extension of products, heel grips, arch support, just anything you can think of that would go along with the brand, foot pedals, right? Um, in 2004, our fourth year, we went from doing $1 million. In, so the first year we did $60,000 in sales. The second year we did $600,000 in sales. Third year, almost a million, not quite, I was so mad. And then the fourth year, Nordstrom buys our products. Nordstrom changed the life of my life, the company, and many people that worked for us. So as soon as Nordstrom, then what happened? It all, others started to follow. Then we went into Target, we went into Dillard's, we went into all these different department stores. Then we made brand extensions. So why would I not do um, a secondary brand. So let's say I made another collection called Fab Feed, and that was from the makers of foot pedals, specifically for Target. It's not the same product that's sold at Nordstrom for this amount. It's a little bit less, lesser product, but it's for the masses. And that's what really grew the company and took it up. And so part of your success was your tenacity mm -hmm. and your willingness to keep fighting and to keep going. Mm -hmm. But part of your success was also being agile and being willing to shift and being willing to redefine and being willing to refocus and redirect. 100%. Just because you have a plan on paper, that doesn't mean that that's how your life is going to turn out. Nothing is written in stone. You have to be flexible. No, that's terrific. Could you talk a little bit about Savvy Travelers, your new yes. venture? Okay, so after selling foot pedals in our 10th year, you know we sold it to a publicly traded company mm -hmm. and um, that was really exciting. I took some time off and I did a lot of community work, wrote a book, did some film, and then <clears throat> now um, my best friend moved here from New Jersey to Orange County mm -hmm. and we decided we didn't want to be one-hit wonders. But also because we've been business travelers for so many years, always getting sick, always having to lug all this stuff, lost luggage, checking bags, time wasted, we're like, you know what, we need a product again. Necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. We thought, what if we did an entire collection of wipes that would substitute all the liquids that you would try, have to try to stuff into right. a little, you know. Right, because we're restricted. What we we're can restricted, bring on the, on yes. The so we, we made um, kind of a challenge to, for, to each other and said, let's do carry on only, no matter where we're going or how long we're going. Because, I mean, we've been, we've lost you know, jewelry, we've lost luggage. I had to do a board presentation once in Ugg boots and a sweatshirt, like with no recap, all my beautiful PowerPoints, all that, like all those things happened. So we were like, we're gonna carry on no matter what. And it just started spiraling. And we've, we really came to find that wipes, there's a huge white space in the market. There's a void. You, there's a lot of baby wipes, but there's not a collection of wipes for cleaning your glasses, cleaning your cell phone, cleaning your face, antiperspirant deodorant wipes, mouth and teeth cleansing wipes. So we created all these different wipes. We have eight different wipes on our collection right now, and each one is application specific. Oh, that's amazing, and and that company is just taking off, and, yeah. it's, and so if folks wanted to um, you know, jump in on that. Yes. Um, they have those opportunities that we have, uh, that we have your site right on the screen right now so people can see it. Yeah. Um, look, maybe we could talk a little bit about um, what it's been like to be a Latina entrepreneur oh. and what challenges that brought um, for you to have to overcome during, your, during mm -hmm. your career so far. Well, being a Latina entrepreneur, I think that we have the, you know, there's this, like concept out there, or maybe it's a stereotype of being hot-headed. Um, so 
because I'm vocal, I'm outspoken, I yell, throw things occasionally, you know, that can be interpreted as being, oh, the devil wears Prada. So no, um, that's being an, an expressive, passionate person. Um, you know, I'm half Mexican and half Irish. So I come from both bottoms of the barrel that built this country. And I've never in my life experienced racism until I've gone out to seek capital, growth capital. To, uh, with a winning track record, I'm starting my second company in a space that is open. Now I want people to come and invest and help me grow this company. You wouldn't believe it. It's like <clears throat> there's not a glass ceiling. There's like a brick wall, 10 layers deep. So it's pretty shocking, but it is really out there and it's really happening. And so um, when you think about the, that challenge mm -hmm. of having to overcome that, uh, overcome the, the diversity mm -hmm. issues, uh, what, kinds of, what kinds of things have, have you tried? What kinds of, well, I'll tell you, I, what I've done is I've decided to um, join a gang. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Meet <laughs> my, him in the parking lot. Right, right. No, no. <laughs> but really, um, you know, the Latino Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you want to get involved, join groups that will help you, that are creating movements mm -hmm. to push ourselves forward and be part of a bigger thing and don't think that you're alone. That's the most important thing. Okay, so that you have a, the, the strength of a community and a strength of, of collective um, consciousness. Yes, absolutely. Oh, no, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. and now, um, being, um, being Latina mm -hmm. uh, and growing up in, in um, difficult circumstances, mm -hmm. Uh, you've become very passionate about diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about how you have um, uh, made sure that diversity and inclusion are a part of your uh, the companies that you've started? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, um, I, I know a lot of people talk about mentoring. I didn't, I, I have a 10th grade education. I did not graduate from high school. So, a lot of things, I don't know the words, but I can figure it out. So people talk about mentors, right? And I didn't know what a mentor was, honestly. And then, Who's your mentor? Wait, I'm like, share. <laughs> you know, I thought that's, that's what, I, I was an idol, right? So find a mentor. My mentor became, was my angel investor. My angel investor became my mentor. Take people under your wings. Later, I helped create the curriculum for a mentor program called the Hispanic 100. I wrote the curriculum and we helped to recruit young Latinos. I'm not interested in people that have are, you know, challenged youth or, you know, people that have, you know, that are kind of going down the wrong path, gang, all that stuff. I'm, that's not my personal passion. What I'm really passionate about is is young Hispanics between the ages of 18 to 25 that age out of every system but are really breaking their backs, the ones that are making good grades, going to school, bettering themselves, working, helping to support their family, many first generations. Those are the ones that I focus in on, I mentor, and I hire, and I give them a chance um, to really figure out what their career is because Sometimes you end up having to start at the bottom just because of your skin color. And, and that's just the truth. That's just the way it is. You know, I've walked out of board meetings when they said, oh, we'll just let the Mexicans clean it up. I'm like, okay, I got to go. I'm like, where are you going? We need you for this meeting. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go clean because I'm Mexican. You're not Mexican. Yes, I am. Be careful who you're talking to. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, you know, the, the great part of your, your commitment to hiring um, the, the, that demographic is that a very high percentage of our students here at Cal State Fullerton are, yes. are right in that demographic. And I've hired and a And they're hardworking <laughs> and, and the really best, focused. The best, the so. smartest, the most dedicated, the most loyal, skills that are so transferable. You know, someone that, you know, was a marketing major ended up being, you know, in in um, public relations. Like, so there's so much crossover and opportunity. No, that's terrific. Um, so, if you were talking to a young, aspiring executive that wanted to build a great business, okay. you know, somebody said, I want to start my own business, mm -hmm. and I want it to be successful. 
Okay. What advice would you give that person? Okay. If you want to start a business, you have to be able to answer these three questions. And this is also in my book. It's what I refer to as the three M's. The first is money. Everybody needs it. You can't do anything without it. So how much money do you need? When do you need it? Where are you going to put it? And where am I, when am I going to see the return on my investment? When are you going to become profitable? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to answer that question. Yes. Then the second question is marketing. Who is your target demographic? What's going to drive them to action? And then you do the same formula again. How much is it going to cost? How much are you going to spend? When are you going to spend it? And when are you going to see the return on that investment? Mm -hmm. So marketing. Then the last but the most important is management. I cannot sell. I get my feelings hurt so bad. Know what you know, what you do well, but it's more important to know what you're not good at and then find the people to do that. So who's going to manage the payroll? Who's going to manage sales? Who's going to manage inventory? Who's going to manage, you know, there's so many things that you have to think about when you're going into a business. Don't think you can do it all because you can try to do it all, but there is going to be a, a weak link somewhere along the line. Fill those links with the strength. Mm -hmm. So again, you very similar. Patty was just on earlier, earlier, and she I talked about her. know yourself, know your strengths, and find people that have different strengths. Yes, and it sounds like that's uh, advice that you would give folks absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, surround yourself with that talent. So the three M's yes. for those of you that are looking to start your own business: money, management, marketing. Money, management, and marketing. Make mm -hmm. sure you know where your money's coming from. Make sure you've got a good marketing plan mm -hmm. and make sure you are going to be able to run this business. Yes. Make sure you can manage it. Mm -hmm. Tina, it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. I want to thank you for being you. here and, and joining us. You've thank been you. terrific. Thank and you're you going to so stick much. around yes. so that you can help us with the Q&A okay. here in just a, just a few minutes. That'll be fun. Um, it's now time for the Leadership Voices Leadership Example. This leadership example comes from Business Insider. Today we present you with 21 diverse executives at Fortune 500 companies. Many of these companies are among the most well-known in the country and across the globe. Hear that? You know what that means. It's time for today's leadership lesson. Are you ready to learn? Albert Einstein once said, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. Every show we bring you, our viewers, an opportunity to learn from faculty expert with a simple but useful three-minute leadership lesson. Today, joining us is Dr. Sean Pickler, Associate Professor at Cal State Fullerton, to talk to us about overcoming diversity in organizations and industry. Hello, I'm Dr. Sean Pickler and here is today's leadership lesson. Today I'll be talking about some key challenges that women face in the workplace as well as ways to overcome those challenges. Women face a variety of challenges in the workplace based on their gender. You've probably heard of the term the glass ceiling. Catalyst reports that all the women occupy 52% of management roles in the US, they represent only 6% of CEO positions among S&P firms. You've probably also heard of the gender pay gap. A Pew Research Center report found that although equally qualified women earn 83% of what men earn, or 83 cents to the dollar in the U.S. What causes these phenomena and what can be done about it? Decision makers, like hiring managers, have a tendency to think manager, think male. In other words, when people think of managers, especially executives, they tend to think of male stereotype characteristics, such as assertiveness or dominance. The challenge for persons with a feminine gender is that when they demonstrate these same characteristics, they violate gender norms and are treated less favorably than persons with a masculine gender. Thus, it is important for organizations to implement programs to mitigate these systematic errors in decision making, like diversity training, as well as programs that support women at work, like flexible work arrangements. And what can women themselves do to earn what they deserve and break through that glass ceiling? I have three evidence-based suggestions. First, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Women tend to negotiate less often than men, which can be very costly over the long term. 
To negotiate successfully, know your value in the market and to the firm. Have a good idea in mind of what your value is given your experience and skill set based on salary surveys from professional associations and the Bureau of Labor Statistics and from talking with others in your field. Sheryl Sandberg suggests that when women negotiate, think I, talk we. In other words, explain your value in terms that signal benefits to the employer. Number two, find a good mentor. Ideally, this will be someone in a position that you see yourself in several years from now. Among other benefits, mentors provide career advice, social support, and role modeling, all of which can translate into more promotions, higher incomes, and higher satisfaction with pay and benefits. And women in particular tend to gain more self-awareness and self-confidence from mentoring. These career and psychological benefits can translate into receiving more social support from others, such as peers and from managers. And number three, and finally, get involved. Real change of any kind isn't possible without collective action. So you might consider joining or starting an, a women's employee resource group for your organization. For instance, the Women at Microsoft Employee Resource Group aims to support women through conferences and summits, recruiting events, and development and mentoring. You might also consider getting involved in a local or national women's organization, such as the Women's March, the mission of which is to harness the political power of diverse women in their communities to create transformative social change. I'm Sean Pickler, and this has been today's Leadership Lesson. Thank you, Professor Pickler, for sharing your insights into overcoming diversity barriers. It's now time for the Leadership Voices Q&A. Do you need some leadership advice? Well, you've come to the right place. Every show we take questions from you, our viewers, and answer them right here on the show. Today we have four questions, and our two guests have agreed to stay on and help us answer these questions for our viewers. Thank you, Patty Arviello of New American Funding, and Tina Aldatz from Foot Pedals and Savvy Travelers for taking part in today's Q&A. Our first question is for Patty Arviello, and it comes from Susan in La Habra, California. Susan writes, as a Hispanic woman in business, some people seem to underestimate what I can do, and it makes me feel disrespected. What advice can you give me to help me overcome the frustration as well as the stereotypes in the workplace? That's an awesome question. It you is. know, it's an awesome question. First, feeling disrespected is something, you know, personally we all have to work through, no matter your environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think, speaking as a business owner, I have 2,500 employees, you know, we don't, I don't look at male, female, obviously myself, but outwork, outwork your, the, the person you're most intimidated by, just outwork that person. Mm -hmm. Because we can do it. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a business owner that I know in this country who isn't going to look at who's providing the most value for your business. You just have to have the confidence in yourself. And being disrespected, that's life. I mean, yeah. it really is. Yeah. Workplace, personal life, you gotta, you gotta, that's just adversity that we're all gonna deal with and just dealing with other human beings. So when you're trying to climb that ladder, being Latina is the power right now. I mean, I would hold that flag up high. It is. It is. It's power. Female. So I see it as power, <laughs> and I think that we just need to do a better job in this country at letting our Latinas in the country feel as, as valued as I know we are. Well, and I think also um, putting forward your strengths being bilingual, if you are bilingual, mm -hmm. don't downplay that. Yeah. And then if you're feeling disrespected, just start speaking, talking about that person in Spanish. Because they're not going to know what you're saying anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that is oh, a that very is big plus. plus. Oh, yeah. well, it's, like, oh. it's a very big plus. I think it's good. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's intimidating back. you got to just kind of muse and reflect. power. Yes. That's great. So our second question, <laughs> this could be really interesting yeah. here. <laughs> our second question is for Tina Aldatz, and it comes okay. from Josephine from Santa Ana, California. Josephine asks, a lot of my friends seem like they have given up trying to make it big at work. But sometimes I think that their giving up is really just my opportunity. But every time I make strides in my career at work, it feels like I'm being held back by others. It feels like some men at work are getting opportunities when they don't match my skills or my qualifications. What advice do you have for someone in my situation that has the skills and talent but isn't getting the opportunities? I love this question. This is so, so, so important, and I lived this. Um, you have to market yourself, okay? You are a brand. 
So when you accomplish something, make sure, because in our culture, we have a tendency to be very humble, to, to downplay things that we do well, especially as women in our culture. It's even not, it's not pretty. You know, we're, all, we're often taught mm -hmm. loud is ugly, soft is pretty, but that's the opposite in business. So yeah, you're right. When other people are giving up, they're just open, open, opening the path for you. It's becoming wider for you to continue to grow in your journey. Also, you, you outgrow people sometimes, and that's okay. That doesn't mean you don't like them, you don't love them, you don't care about them, but you need to surround yourself in, with people that you aspire to be, to, to grow into. So someone that has skills and talents but that is not getting the opportunities, you have to be vocal. You, there are more opportunities now than ever in history. So you have yeah. to take them because if you don't take them, somebody else will. Sounds to me like you're not grabbing what's yours. Right. And you have, and you know, being vocal, like I said, every little kid, you know, when we were called bossy, I'm sure mm -hmm. you were bossy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that girl, she's so bossy. <laughs> you know, we're going to be labeled no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to just remember that the worst thing you can do is not speak up. And maybe you could practice your, how you're gonna, you know, I have, a, I have this really good overwhelming personality, right? So when I speak up, everybody hears me. Mm -hmm. So you can work on your approach, but yes. not speaking up is really what will hold you back. Speaking yes. up is never gonna hurt you. And there isn't, like I said, there isn't mm -hmm. a business owner that doesn't appreciate male, right. female, right. male, female. Yeah. We want to run successful businesses, so we want will over skill sometimes. We want to see that power and that strength come from somebody communicating Absolutely. to us that we're really good. You need yeah. to notice me. Yeah. You know, I actually won't hire someone unless they get through what I call the gatekeepers. So I might interview someone. I might look at the resume, talk to them. But unless they follow up or they get past the gatekeepers, the receptionist, the financial officer, whoever's answering the phones or taking that call, if they can get past them and get to me, I want to meet this person. That's, that impresses me. Be persistent. It's very important. Oh, that's terrific. That's terrific. So we have our third question okay. is for Patty. And so our third question comes from Terry C. in Artesia, California. Uh, Terry asks, if I want to succeed in a male-dominated workplace, what do I need to start doing today to be ready to overcome these barriers? Well, I work in a male-dominated industry. You know, I'm, I'm in financial services, and I started when I was 16 years old. And still today, it's very dominated, not only by male, but white male. So mm -hmm. what I did um, very early on is find... There are women. There's women in every category of business today. But yeah. you need to find somebody that looks and mirrors yourself. So that mentorship. And they don't even know that you're slightly being mentored by them. But you can watch them interact at a level higher than you, and you will start to rise in your organization. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said... I'm a champion of men, too. I married one. Yeah. I gave birth to two. You know, I love men. And I'll tell you what. Men love women like us. Mm -hmm. They want to have, they want to give birth to daughters that want to be bossy, that want to succeed. So it's not so much male holding us back. As Latinas, we hold ourselves back because mm -hmm. we're taught to be respectful, to be quiet. Expect to be rewarded. Yes. Well, don't expect to be rewarded. You need to ask. And then we need to rush home and take care of our kids and not try to climb the ladder of success. Mm -hmm. But you can have it all. So I just really think that we need to ourselves look at who we are as prizes right now in the organizations, especially Latinas. Mm -hmm. We are champions right now in this in this. In, this, in our country, even though the media sometimes the will make you kind of feel bad. But yeah. bust through that. Bust yeah. through that. There are people like us, and we're very outspoken. Find us. That's why we're here. I'm so happy you had the both of us because, you know, we, we travel in the same circles, and I admire her so much. And, I, and we were introduced because of that because I'm mm -hmm. like, who else is like me? Find women like yourself yes. and your organization, and yeah. you will rise to their level. Yes, you will. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have one final question, okay. and this fourth question is for Tina. Okay. And it comes from Shakita in Sh Cyprus, California. Okay. Shakita asks, what advice would you have for a minority woman to make it as an entrepreneur in today's business world? Oh, this is a, this is a good one. I recently found out a lot of this information. So diversity programs exist. Whether or not you choose to take advantage of them, 
is up to you. So I'm going to give you a few examples. So there's, you can become a certified women business enterprise. You can become minority owned. You can become women owned. Now, all of these opportunities and these certifications, right. yeah, these certifications are required by certain businesses to have a percentage of their business allocated to these minority groups. Mm -hmm. So become aligned, become certified, right. join those groups, and then utilize them as your resource and the gateway to find business and grow your own business. Right. And find I happen to be one of the largest MBEs, minority business yes. owners, and one of the largest minority women-owned businesses in the country. So I know that. And the world. Right. And another thing I think is very, very valuable, and I learned this from another powerhouse Latina uh, who actually owns the Colorado Rockies. And who knew that? A Latina oh owns a majority piece of Colorado Rockies. Wow. She said, networking's one valve from not working. Oh, that is so true. You have to put yourself out there yes. in whatever industry you are and get aligned with your trade mm -hmm. associations and go and meet people. There's yeah. power in people. Yeah. So you've got a network. And, yes. and embrace who you are, okay? I, I found myself once, I was heading to a bank banking meeting. And I'm looking through my closet and I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm going to a bank. So I was pulling out my pinstriped suit and my blue shirt pants and I'm like, why, why am I doing this? I'm not the banker. I'm the customer. Yes. Why am I trying to let him wear the suit and the blue shirt? I'm going to wear my flowery dress and do what I want because I'm the customer. I'm owning who I am. I'm a Latina woman. I'm strong. I'm powerful. If they want my money, then they better work for it. Absolutely. Be, <laughs> be genuine to yourself. Yes. Now, this, I think you guys have given us some amazing advice and um, I think that our viewers are going to be ecstatic to learn um, about many of the uh, wisdom that you've shared in, the, in this Q&A. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Great information. See, I'm always It's learning. really fun. Yeah. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed the day. We've had a lot of uh, fun, especially behind the scenes and, <laughs> and between cuts and takes. Right. <laughs> um, but it's been great. And uh, thank you for, for being a part of the show. I need to do the outtake, so I'm going to okay. go over here and say that this has been the Leadership Voices Q&A. Thank you to our two guests for providing the answers to today's Q&A, both Patty Arviello and Tina Aldetz. You've both given our viewers some great advice to guide their entrepreneurial and career success. If you have a question or need advice, having leadership challenges at work and need some expertise and insights, send us your question here to the Leadership Voice by email, leadershipvoice at fullerton.edu, or contact us by Twitter, at CSUF underscore leadership. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today's show. Today, we explored overcoming diversity for entrepreneurial success. Thank you to Ms. Patty Ariello, New American Funding, and Tina Aldet, Savvy Travelers. Thank you also to our special faculty guest, Professor Sean Pickler, for delivering today's leadership lesson. Join us each episode of The Leadership Voice as we'll have two more executive guests, another special leadership lesson, and lots more worth tuning in to see. I'm Jay Barbuto, and on behalf of the Center for Leadership in Mahalo College of Business and Economics, we'll see you next time right here on The Leadership Voice. Mm -hmm.